to uh, like to welcome to the stage Vinod Cuddy. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, he works for the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. For those of you who don't know, uh, it is uh, one of the largest exchanges in the world and the largest derivatives exchange in the world. Um, and I've been told that you can park a 747 on their trading floor. Um, he is also a boss of a friend of mine. Um, so this doesn't color my introduction at all. Um, so since 2003, he has played a, a lead role in the design, implementation, and support for the open systems environment for uh, CME Group. And he is also the chair of the End User Council for the Linux Foundation. So uh, he's going to be talking about Linux on x86. So if you will, please give a warm uh, round of applause to Vinod Cuddy. Thanks, Robert. All right, and it's uh, Friday, end of the day, or last talk of the day, I guess. Um, so I'm going to, I've given different versions of this talk at different events over the years, and uh, as I go through the slides, you'll see uh, what happened as I presented abroad is I, I got into trouble with a lot of translators because I used to keep the slides to a minimum, and uh, at least the verbiage to a minimum, and just speak off the cuff. And a lot of translators were pissed off because they couldn't translate my material. So over time, I've just started noting down more and more text in the in the slides because it's easier uh, with audiences that don't speak English to actually read the slides rather than follow what I'm saying. But hopefully, that is necessary here. So I'm going to cover. Um, some of our history. So obviously I'm presenting this from the point of view of, of an enterprise, right? We started off with proprietary systems and we've been very happy with Linux. And uh, this is the first time I've presented at Flourish and when I looked at the website, I, I noticed part of, you know, one of the goals at least uh, seemed to be to kind of uh, present the use of Linux in, an, uh, in the business environment. So even though Many of you, I assume, are familiar with the benefits of Linux. I'm going to present things from the point of view of an enterprise, uh, and maybe that'll give you a better perspective on what's happening in our industry, at least. So, you know, we started off as the um, Chicago uh, Butter and Egg Board. So we've been around for a while, and over the years, if you've followed, you know, what's happened in Chicago, uh, we've had a long history of innovation in the financial instruments, in the futures industry specifically. And so we've merged with the uh, Chicago Board of Trade and we've also uh, acquired NYMEX. And so today we have uh, a pretty wide reach across a wide variety of financial instruments and specifically derivatives and options on derivatives. So we are the largest uh, derivatives exchange in the world. And uh, you know what used to be called the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or CME or the Merck has evolved into a larger entity called CME Group that encompasses uh, CME itself plus the Chicago Board of Trade and then the NYMEX. So anything related to oil and gas tends to happen in NYMEX and a lot of other types of uh, products happen here in Chicago. You know, we're in about 85 countries worldwide. Uh, we have a partnership uh, with uh, BVMF Bovespa in Brazil and that's actually something I spent a lot of time last year doing was traveling back and forth there uh, to help them uh, implement the next. So we are becoming increasingly global. Just to give you a sense of our, our scale, um, we, we trade a lot of futures and options contracts. And as an example, in our most active year a couple of years ago, we saw volume as high as 3.3 billion contracts. And that has a notional value of about 1.2 quadrillion dollars. Now today it's a little less than that because uh, you know of volume fluctuations, but in general it gives you a sense of the value of the transactions that we handle, and that's why it's an extremely uh, mission critical environment. Uh, so not only is performance important, but when you consider the risk involved, we have to make sure our systems are stable. And this has traditionally been an area where enterprises have been afraid to adopt open source and Linux solutions. We do have some proprietary systems that we're migrating off of, but for the most part today, uh, our primary electronic trading platform is Linux on x86 servers. So our former, CIO used, used, our former CIO used to call this the crap that we deal with, which is basically 
we have to worry about capacity, reliability, availability, and performance. And this requires a lot of R&D. But we don't want to be on the bleeding edge necessarily. We have to address our requirements and control costs at the same time. So it's a balancing act. What this means in, in terms of technical challenges for my team and for others at uh, CME Group is that we constantly worry about uh, microseconds. How many microseconds does it take to process a transaction? How many microseconds does it take to get a message from machine A to machine B? Uh, and that's extremely important in our industry. It's more important for some of our customers, but um, overall, that's a big concern for us. We want, from, a, from the Linux kernel perspective, we want deterministic low latency uh, thread scheduling, but we don't want to sacrifice throughput. So if I've got you know, 100 threads processing 100 different customer transactions, we want each of those to perform well. Uh, we, low latency multicast UDP is very important in our environment. So uh, if you know anything about pop sub mechanisms, uh, that's basically the uh, principle behind a lot of our application architectures. And, and that rides on top of multicast UDP. Uh, we also are, you know, very, one, uh, another big challenge for us is just the availability of performance diagnostic tools that are low overhead and production ready. Uh, we also want high density servers. It doesn't necessarily mean blades, it just means in our data centers we have sufficient cooling and power capacity to cram a lot of servers in there. And uh, today that means one, one rack unit high x86 servers. Uh, and of course, a big challenge for us over the years has been finding x86 servers that are designed for Linux. And I'm going to go into a little more detail later about what that means. So let's talk a bit about our history and why we migrated to Linux. And for us, Linux today means Red Hat or RHEL. At the time, that was the uh, only realistic commercial offering in the US. Um, and today, you have more options if you want a commercial enterprise Linux distribution. Uh, and it, it was driven a lot by cost, right? We were using proprietary Spark systems. They were expensive. And the performance of the x86 CPU started to rival and exceed the Spark CPUs we were using. So that was a big motivation. But we were also looking to the future. You know, at the time, I don't remember what uh, round trip times for uh, transactions were, but they were in the order of uh, hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, and as we start to, started to scale and, and more of our business moved into electronic trading from our pits, we needed to grow our uh, Linux infrastructure, or basically our server infrastructure. And Linux was a big part of that. And that was a, a big motivation to move to it. So when we first tried it out, you know, we were cautious in the Red Hat, Red Hat 2.1 days, obviously, it wasn't as mature as it is now. And we started to use it for non-customer facing applications. And as we gained confidence with it and we trained more personnel and we saw the performance benefits, we started to move more applications to it. And there was a phase where we would run a primary uh, and a backup on two different operating systems on Solaris and Linux, and that would allow us to hedge our risk. It took us on the order of about 18 months to migrate from Solaris to Linux. I mean, obviously, there's a big chunk that we did at first, and there's a long tail of applications where the owners just never want to move off them until they're dragged kicking and screaming into a new platform. So um, most of our systems were migrated by late 2004, and then I, I think we didn't really get to that 99% until probably 2005, 2006 timeframe. Now we're pretty large, at least compa comparatively. Uh, we have many thousand servers out there, and yet growing. And a lot of our pain points during the migration weren't necessarily application coding uh, challenges. They tended to be more of the administrative things like monitoring or, or shell scripting and those types of things that were different between Linux and Solaris. Um, it also helped that we had a lot of applications written in Java. I think that if we had started off uh, in a pure C environment, it would have taken longer to port our applications because there was uh, there would have been a tighter coupling to the underlying OS. So I think that helped. And then you know our, we've had a close relationship with our distribution vendors uh, over the years, and that's helped us as well. From a training perspective, it wasn't that hard. Uh, it was just we treated it as a different flavor of Unix. Um, and you know, it took a team of about 15 people in the order of about six to eight months to get fully trained. And as I said earlier, we were really 
nervous about moving to Linux. We didn't really consider it to be mature, and, and it truly wasn't at the time. Uh, but every year it gets better, and it's gotten better over the years, and we're happy with what we have now. But the other thing you know, that we learned uh, that's true of any IT organization is that it's not just the technology that matters, the people matter as well. So having good talent is just as important as the underlying technology. So I'm going to quickly go over how Linux has helped us and how Linux on a volume server specifically has helped us. Because we do see vendors selling us solutions, uh, that, you know, much you know, bigger iron types of solutions that aren't really uh, in the sweet spot in terms of price versus performance. So the, the x86 space, especially the two socket server platform is, is a sweet spot in terms of price performance. It, it beats any other platform we've tested so far. Um, there is, you know, we hear ARM is kind of in the race to move beyond the embedded space into the server market, and that also offers us, uh, you know, if they go ahead as planned, it remains to be seen whether they can compete. Uh, initially, when we first moved to Linux, we had some performance issues on the Solaris TCPIP stack that was solved in Linux, and I think it was partly because it was more monolithic TCPIP stack. Support, obviously, uh, support has been cheaper, um, both from a hardware and an operating system perspective. Uh, it, you know, we, it, it also helps, our size does help to some extent in the sense that we can negotiate better deals with Red Hat than if we were a smaller company, but overall, we feel that this is a more cost-effective platform than our prior proprietary system. Uh, we have more choices for support, so uh, even though we use Red Hat today, technically because it's Linux, we're not completely locked in, we're somewhat locked in, but for the most part, we, we know that we are at a lower risk than if we were using a proprietary system. Um, horizontal scalability maps very well to the one rack unit server running Linux. If we, were if we were used to running, let's say, uh, a 64 CPU system in the old days, it would have been harder for us to move to this. But the fact that our apps scale horizontally maps very well to the Linux model. Not to say that Linux can't scale today, but at the time we were looking at this, uh, that was an important factor. The other thing uh, is that we, we, you know, if you consider the whole platform, not just the OS, but the hardware as well, the, there are some features that I'll go into later when I talk about implementation details, such as the uh, chassis swap capability that are very important for us in maintaining a large data center to be able to quickly replace hardware. And that hardware-based RAID 1 has helped us in that regard. Um, and of course, the x86 space compared to other uh, proprietary CPUs, uh, because of the competition, we've seen a lot of innovation over the years. What you can buy today versus what you could buy 12 months ago is generally a significant leap. When AMD was doing stronger, uh, when they were stronger, they actually, I think, uh, were a good example of how competition in the space has helped us benefit as customers. So it's not just Linux per se, it's Linux on x86, I think, that has uh, given us the best bang for the buck. And this is just another analogy of what I've just described, which is when you buy large proprietary systems that are supposedly targeted at mission critical environments like ours, there's typically a lot of R&D that goes into designing the systems. They're complex, they take you know, a lot of time to develop. What that means is it, it results in more expensive systems for us to buy. So, the analogy is you're not buying tanks, you're buying you know, your, your reliable Honda Civic or something else like that. And that's what's important to us. Uh, I mentioned reliability. So we do care about some of the hardware features, but they're not the sole determinant of whether or not a platform is suitable for us. We do recognize that, especially if you're going to scale horizontal, you know, fault tolerance of the application there is very important. It gives you more control over your hardware purchases. It also uh, in theory, you can have higher uptimes with less reliable hardware. So again, there's a cost benefit from an enterprise perspective when you're buying thousands of servers. These are the types of things to think about. Uh, and I already talked about horizontal scalability. It, horizontal scalability does fit this commodity server very well. And of the operating systems out there, Linux is the platform of choice on the commodity x86 server space. Uh, I've already talked about the one and two socket space. That, that's what we consider the sweet spot. We haven't seen any change over the last six years. That, it, that remains today the best price performance. Uh, 
and uh, the number of cores per socket keeps increasing and so we've actually been pushing for one socket systems and we would rather use the real estate of the motherboard for more memory or more channels to memory. From a hardware support perspective, uh, the way we operate at NetaSend is we don't allow vendors to come in and fix hardware. We just maintain spare pools of parts. So if, got a, if I've got a thousand servers in one data center, typically there's a range of maybe three or four models of server. And those are, uh, for each model, we've got spares you know, in terms of drives or memory or other types of things. And so that model is something that we've implemented and uh, we feel it works very well for us because we can respond much quicker than we can uh, to event an external than an external vendor coming in. But it also means, from a cost perspective, we don't do what we used to do, which is pay millions of dollars for support contracts for someone to come in two hours after you call them. We don't wait. We just, as soon as something fails, we go in and swap out. And we, when the vendor comes in, it's typically just to pick up the bad part. And not, not everyone does this, but we like this model. And this is where, you know, when I, was, when I mentioned earlier the hardware, uh, the, the chassis swap cap capability, we typically, if, there's, if an issue takes too long to diagnose, we'll take the drives out of one system and stick them in, in an identical chassis and we're up and running in a few minutes. And so it's a simple technique. You know, some people talk about booting off the sand and doing other types of things like that, but we found that that's a very simple, robust technique that works for us. Uh, from a support perspective, you know, obviously, as an enterprise, we, we haven't gone fully down the open source model of just relying on the community for support. We still purchase commercial support. But as I mentioned before, the talent is just as important as the technology. And so we do make a point of training our, our admins. We want mechanics, not just end users. We want people who can dive in under the hood. And it's, uh, you know, it's a business risk if you rely solely on a vendor. We've talked to when I travel and I talk to other customers who are hesitant to use open source solutions, um, their typical MO is to, whenever there's a production issue, call the vendor and then sit on there, you know, just sit and wait for the vendor to fix their problems. That doesn't work in a mission critical environment. It's to your advantage to know as much as you can about the systems you're operating. And from that perspective, open source and Linux lower our business risk because we have the ability to hire people who understand things at a lower level, whereas with proprietary systems, you're completely at the mercy of the vendor uh, to support you. Our support structure internally consists of multiple levels. Uh, obviously, we have an internal staff that's very experienced, but once an issue is escalated to our internal team, if we cannot handle it, then we filter out the ones that deserve the attention of a vendor like Red Hat and then get them involved. Um, and if it's a really serious issue, and we have had some serious issues like this, uh, especially performance issues, we can actually look at the source code while the vendor is looking at it as well. So that's another example of how, in a mission critical environment like ours, open source and Linux specifically have helped us. But at the same time, we're not kernel developers, right? We don't, we haven't yet moved into that cost model of owning and maintaining our own patch set. So again, I think most of you are familiar with these benefits, and I'm just reviewing them at a high level to give you the enterprise perspective. There are some scenarios, some sample scenarios such as this, where you have some performance issue and you you don't know what the what it really is. In, in a scenario such as this, where you're using a proprietary system, you would be waiting for the vendor to solve the problem. But if you're using an open source solution like Linux typically in parallel with the vendor investigating the problem. You can follow along in the source code. You know, you'd be surprised at how many times we've found obscure bugs that Red Hat didn't have in their distribution that someone upstream, just by searching Google, had uh, provided a patch for. Uh, that, you know, it might not have even been in the upstream kernel. It might have been just one specific use case that someone had found a fix for. No one had adopted it until we came along and said, you know what, this would work for us. Red Hat or Linux community, please adopt this. So over the years, we've seen an increasing benefit to using Linux. And I, when I talk to other peers in the industry who may not have adopted Linux, one of the concerns has been this, uh, this type of support scenario. And this is a good example of why it helps to have Linux versus another proprietary operating system. 
but, but the key thing is here is you're an active participant, you're not just an, a bystander. And another example is uh, knowledge transfer. When you find an issue in a proprietary solution and you help the vendor fix their problem, that knowledge of how to fix the problem stays with the vendor. So if you later try to switch to an, a, another vendor, you've lost all that time you spent in solving that problem. In a, an open source solution like Linux, you don't have to worry about that. Typically, that knowledge is captured. You know that in these types of performance sensitive uh, use cases, the knowledge gained about how to solve those problems translates from one vendor to another. So that capture of, the knowledge capture um, in the long run benefits us. Because if you think about it, we're essentially acting as QA for our vendors, right? You purchase a product, you may customize and use it, uh, you may encounter some bugs or design issues, and then you have this feedback loop where you communicate those back to the vendor, they improve their product, they sell to more customers, and so on and so forth. But you're locked into the cycle where no other vendors are privy to those things. And so when you look at the maturity of open source or Linux solutions, typically uh, it has been an unfair comparison because some of these open source solutions weren't able to participate in this feedback loop. Now that Linux is in more enterprises, uh, there's more participation in this feedback loop and there's more ability for us to ensure that our investment in time and energy in, in QAing third-party products isn't wasted. If I solve a problem today and I, if I help the Linux community or Red Hat or some other vendor solve a problem that affects us today, I know that two years from now, if I switch to a different distribution, that that time was not wasted because we've educated the community about our use cases. Um, and, and kind of related to that is the way in which we communicate with other customers. It's much easier for me to talk to another customer in a similar situation to us and say, hey, have you seen this problem with Linux? You know, it's in this part of the stack. You know, here's the patch set that we're using than I could using a proprietary system. But it, it, you know, in a sense, life is full of examples like this about things that you do or that are critical to you where you consider openness to be important. It could be as simple as knowing what's in the medicine you're taking or what's in the food you eat. There are critical situations in life where openness is expected, but what's funny is that in, in a lot of mission critical environments, that doesn't translate. There's somehow this disconnect that says, I don't care if I, I don't know what's going on, it's okay to operate a mission critical environment on that. And so, I think as a society, we expect openness from other parts of our lives, and I think it's reasonable to say that if you're operating a mission critical environment, that openness is just as important. And another aspect of openness in a mission critical environment is, is who takes responsibility for issues and who you blame. I've seen a lot of situations where sysadmins take the attitude that this is a commercial product. If rebooting doesn't fix it, it's a vendor's problem. It's not my problem. You know? But in an open source solution, you can be a more active participant. You can take responsibility for understanding what's going on. And if you really care about the environment, uh, you can improve it. So what I see happening is we are growing talent that cares more about the infrastructure, that takes a more active role and is not quick to blame another way. We actually do have people that try to make an effort to improve the system, and I think overall as a company, we're better for it. And that goes to what I mentioned earlier, which is we're hiring mechanics, not operators, and uh, you know, a mechanic wants to know what's under the hood, a doctor wants to know what's, under the, you know, what's going on under the covers, and so these are, again, things that translate well into real life scenarios as well, non-technology areas. And it's only possible because of Linux and open source. Performance is something that we benefit from as well, and I think it's partly because if you look at the industry today, you look at the high performance computing space, if you look at the financial industry, everyone's using Linux for mission critical uh, applications. And we benefit from that by having a larger community focused on that. We're no longer in the minority. We're part of, you know, we, we have a seat at the table of a larger party that's going on. and we, as a business, reduce our exposure to problems uh, that might occur if we were using a platform that's more proprietary, used by fewer users. So having a large number of people use it in mission critical performance sensitive areas is very important to us. And another way of looking at it is, I feel like Linux is kind of becoming like the Wikipedia of operating systems, you know, without some of the other, I guess with more moderation. 
because there's some negative connotations to that. Uh, we're c contributing to the knowledge about how to build operating systems. And uh, that helps us commoditize the solutions that are available, and that in turn reduces the cost to us as a business. And it also means that there's a huge industry momentum before it, behind it. So we're looking at low latency networking technologies, InfiniBand, 10 gigabit, Ethernet, all these other things. And because we're using an open solution with a lot of industry momentum behind it, it means that we have access to the latest technology all the time. It has also helped us implement a dual vendor strategy. So we were initially on one vendor's platform, and now we have more than one vendor. It allows us to uh, force the vendors to compete. And again, this combination of Linux and x86 is what's made this possible. We've had other types of cost savings in terms of using rack mount servers versus other types of big iron solutions. Uh, we've had, even though we may not, even though we're using a Red Hat distribution today, the fact that we are in a space that's competitive means that um, there's only so much a distribution vendor can charge before the market discovers that they're paying too, we're paying too much for something. And that was not true in a proprietary system where you only have one source for a solution. Uh, and there's other benefits that you know, are obvious. So I think, I'm hoping that some of this, the technical implementation details are probably going to be of more interest to you than some of the other generic uh, open source benefits. So I want to give you a sense of how we implement this because what I find from talking to a lot of people who use Linux is that they don't understand the challenges of implementing Linux on a large scale. And actually these are true, uh, not just whether you're using Linux, but any commercial, or any Unix environment on, at scale tends to face these challenges. So if you look at the stack there, I've broken it down into the server platform that consists of the, the server motherboard with CPUs, memory, drives, so on and so forth, and the service processor. And on top of that, you have the operating system and then applications. One key thing that we expect is the platform is headless. We see a lot of uh, folks in the Linux community talking about pressing or clicking on a button or, or pressing control all F1 or something to switch virtual terminals. That doesn't exist in an environment. No frame buffers. And that's part of what we mean by having an x86, a Linux-friendly x86 environment. That's been one of the challenges. Understanding that what was formerly a platform for DOS and Windows doesn't work as well in a Linux environment if you assume there's a frame buffer. Our basic platform is a, uh, a single socket system. It's actually a dual socket with one socket populated. And I expect that will continue. Um, you know, one of the challenges we've had over the years is that the x86 servers, are, even though we call them commodity servers, there's still value add in terms of the server, pro sorry, the management processors, uh, hardware event monitoring, that are, those types of things are unique to each vendor that you buy from. So Dell has a different solution than HP for burning you know, firmware from Linux or obtaining uh, memory dim failure events or checking power supply status or temperature. So those aspects are not truly commoditized, but we would like them to be. And I think some of the challenges we face are because you're taking a system with a frame buffer with a bias that expects you to be able to hit a function key or interact with it manually and making it a server platform. And in a sense, it's a, it's a desktop, a DOS Windows desktop peg forced into a Windows, uh, into a server hole, basically. And as I mentioned earlier, when we've talked to vendors over the years, we've rejected a lot of them because they say we support Linux, but if you actually look at the platforms they're offering, they don't truly support it. I could run Linux on a PlayStation, but it doesn't mean I'm going to run my business on it. There's more to it than just running Linux. And even if you look at the hardware compatibility lists of a lot of uh, distributions, the hardware compatibility lists only test the fact that the operating system and drivers load. They don't cover a lot of these management and other types of things that are important in an enterprise environment. And that's why it's been hard for us to choose anything but the top couple of tiers of uh, OEMs for hardware. So running Linux means more to us than what uh, the vendors tell you. Uh, and I, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to go into more details, so I'm going to skip through this quickly, but basically, when we say enterprise Linux ready, we mean some of the hardware friendly features, as well as the robustness of the platform itself. And we're not using upstream kernels today. We do experiment with them in the lab, but for us, enterprise Linux means an upstream distribution, which tends to mean that we're a little behind some of the latest 
developments in the kernel, but we accept that uh, for a more stable environment and, and something that evolves at a pace that we can keep up with. So other types of things that uh, you may not think about, but if you, but they are very important in a large environment. Things like labeling, right? You buy a server, you buy one server, you stick it in a rack, a drive fails, it's easy for you to walk up and say, oh, that drive failed. You buy a thousand of them, and you walk up to, with the replacement part, and the front of the driver is, sorry, the front of the server is nice and shiny, and you have no idea whether the part you're about to stick in there matches the part that's in there. There are a lot of these little things that the less mature vendors don't think about, but we worry about them because, again, it's a mission critical environment, we have a lot going on, we want to reduce that risk of human error, and things like labeling or status LEDs, um, those things are important to us. Hardware radar is another important thing, and another implementation detail that is an important environment like ours. So it used to be, in our Solaris days, and even some of the early Linux days, we played with LVM or using this suite or something else like that, uh, or, or Veritas Volume Manager. And what would happen is, you know, out of a sample of, you know, let's say a thousand servers, every weekend, maybe a couple of drives would fail. The hardware technician in the data center would call the sysadmin and say, I need to bring this machine down to replace the drive, or, or if it's hot swappable, can I replace it now? Someone had to manually type in some commands related to LVM or whatever else the software rate of solution of choice would be, and then you're up and running. With the hardware RAID, where the RAID controller writes metadata about the drive configuration to the volume itself, we're able to eliminate the step where a sysadmin is involved because the data center technician can do the drive replacement themselves uh, and not have to involve a sysadmin unless something goes wrong. So that model has dramatically uh, reduced the cost of maintenance in our data centers. And so, again, this is a key feature of some of the top tier vendors, which is their rate controllers store metadata about the rate configuration on the drives themselves. It also means that we can take a volume, let's say a server fails, and it's, we don't know exactly what's going on. It could be a motherboard issue, it just keeps hanging, and we've got a deadline. This machine has to be up in 20 minutes. Essentially, we abandon that hardware. We, have an, we typically have pools of identical hardware in the racks. We'll shut down the machine, take the drives out, stick them in an identical chassis, and we're up and running in a few minutes. And you'd be amazed at the number of vendors that fall apart when, when you do that. So that is important to us. And then related to that are things like, can you get uh, events about drive failure in the OS from the hardware rate controller? Can you update the hardware rate controller's firmware from the OS? Uh, when you boot up the machine, does it expect a graphical interface at, at the BIOS, or can you get through the, the RAID controller configuration using a serial console? Those are the types of things that matter to us, and those are the types of things that distinguish the better vendors from the ones that don't really understand a Linux in a large scale. So this is important. You know, some people think the serial console is dead, but it, I can tell you it's alive and well, and it's, it's, a, it's a robust solution. Now, when I say serial console, there's a physically attached serial cable, and then there's newer forms of redirecting serial console connectivity over an IP network. We consider the physical serial connection today to be more robust. I can stick a machine in, and three years later, pull it out of the racks, and for that entire three years, it would not have lost its console connection. And the way in which we implement that today is we have ConServer, which is an open source product, running on the network, logging everything that goes on on our machines. Uh, we've had stories from Red Hat about how a customer would send them a bug report and they took a, a screenshot of their screen with the kernel panic and the, tech, the Red Hat support engineer spent an hour typing in the text. We don't deal with that. Uh, it's like, it's the equivalent of taking a picture of your screen and emailing it every time you want to send someone an email. So, we log everything all the time. We can take the actual text of messages that appear from the kernel on the console. I can tell you, you know, if an auditor comes in and says, what was happening on this machine three months ago at one in the morning, we can go find that text on the console server because it's locked. And again, a headless environment with no frame buffers uh, enables this type of uh, solution. So if you think, and again, I've, I've covered this in, in sufficient detail, but basically I'm just reiterating the point that uh, this whole idea of managing your servers using a keyboard, video, and mouse is, is very much a Windows DOSism. It's not, it has no place in the Unix environment. Uh, 
we've tried some of the IP based mechanisms. So there's IP my serial over LAN. Uh, it's very poor, to put it mildly. And it leaves a lot to be desired. It's not stable. Uh, we are pushing our vendors to support SSH and store the ability. We've been asking for the ability to store our SSH keys on the management processor so we can use existing techniques for managing our servers to manage uh, them through the management processor. So the standard uh, Intel spec for IPMI and BMC, Baseboard Management Controller, are very much, in my opinion, a design by committee solution because they don't consider the needs of real Linux admins. But it's low cost and a lot of farms of machines, in, you know, in, in large scale out environments with web farms where you don't care about the failure of an individual node, it's good enough for them. If you have 50,000 machines, uh, you don't care about this type of functionality. But we do in a mission critical environment where every machine, even though we have fault tolerance of the application layer, uh, the failure of a node incurs latency for us. And so it helps, it pays for us to cover, bo uh, cover both scenarios, basically application failure and hardware failure, to the extent we can. Uh, another challenge in Linux in a mission critical environment has been the predictable enumeration of devices. If I've got, typically our servers are de deployed with anywhere from four to six, four to eight Ethernet NICs. Most Linux developers at Red Hat or other distributions are running a desktop with one network interface and don't understand why when we stick an additional NIC in our machine, we don't want ETH0 to become ETH1. And uh, this is a constant challenge. So we have been working with the Linux Foundation and Dell in particular, this guy there, Matt Tom, has been very active in helping push this through. Fedora 15 and now Red Hat 601 have a new BIOS dev name feature where the BIOS enumerates onboard NICs first and when the OS boots up, it reads those BIOS, SM BIOS records and says, these are my onboard NICs, I'll enumerate them first. So again, this is the type of enterprise functionality we're looking for. Uh, firmware updates from Linux, a lot of vendors don't support that. In order to update the firmware, you have to boot into some DOS disk and update the firmware that way, and that's horrible. Uh, Dell has an interesting idea, which is they've started providing firmware updates as RPM, so you can stick them in your YAML repository, and you can run some scripts to pull them uh, from your YAML repository, and I like that idea. Bias, I mentioned that before, it's something we curse under our breaths all the time, and I'd like to see something like Coreboot, basically a Linux replacement for the bias uh, takeover. Uh, from a monitoring perspective, we don't use solutions that assume you're going to have some large network-based solution that's going to periodically go into each server and poke it. We do have some of those, but we like our systems to be fairly autonomous. What this means is uh, we configure all our Linux systems to log hardware events locally. We've seen some solutions where if a DIMM fails or a power supply fails, the operating system's unaware of it. It's communicated through a separate channel. Uh, to a separate monitoring tool. We don't like those solutions. We want the, the health of the hardware to be transparent to the OS. Uh, and again, this is where different vendors uh, provide different solutions, and the vendors we've picked tend to provide this capability. Ideally, I'd like a standard solution, so you install your Linux stack, and it doesn't matter what the hardware vendor is, you get all those events in the OS, you can update the firmware using a sing single tool, and you're, you're happy. Uh, we like non-volatile system logs, so when there's an error on a server and you rebuild the OS, it's nice to look at the history of hardware events on that platform and know one year ago this system had five failures of power supply, so there must be something wrong with it. Um, I mentioned IPMI. It's considered a management solution, but it's really weak, and um, it works in certain types of scale-out environments, but it doesn't work for us. Power metering, again, increasingly important to us as we manage the power consumption in our data centers. Uh, we just built a new data center that went live last year with an in initial capacity of 25 megawatts that can scale in increments of 25 megawatts up to 100 megawatts. And so we have a lot of power and cooling capability to match at our disposal, but we want to make efficient use of that so that we're not building another data center anytime soon. So, if I look at what we expect from the combination of Linux and the hardware going forward, firmware is very important to us. I would like to replace the BIOS with Linux. There's a new UEFI solution that's out there. I think it's poor. Uh, Intel's very opposed to using um, open source at this level. AMD is a lot more friendly, so we're trying to work with them and encourage this. But it's a long-term goal. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. 
but it opens up a lot of possibilities for us. Uh, we're going to continue emphasizing more commoditized solutions. So the features I've, asked, uh, I've mentioned so far are things that we ask our vendors about all the time because we want, when, when we say the next one's on this platform and we, we say Linux is enterprise ready, we want the hardware capabilities to match the OS capabilities. We want a solid platform that's better than anything else out there. Uh, we're working with the Linux Foundation and the kernel developers, at, you know, key kernel developers on things like system tap, F-Trace, LTT, and G. I meet, with, I meet with those guys at least two or three times a year at various conferences, and the, the basic requirement for this is when there's a production issue, we want to know exactly what happened. If a transaction today takes 100 microseconds and tomorrow the transaction takes 200 microseconds, I'd like to be able to say that this specific network I.O. was generated by this thread in this process, which called this method, and say that this is the cause of the latency. Today cannot do that easily. It's very hard. And of course, we want to do that with minimal impact on the running system. Uh, so that, that's, again, something that we're driving, and I'm working with the Linux Foundation on. Another thing that's important to us, as mentioned, is low latency. And typically what happens is, in order to get low latency, you kind of have to trade off throughput. Because in order to, for the kernel scheduler to meet deadlines, it's occupying more of your CPU trying to meet deadlines. And it's kind of like the, what the JVMs call ergonomics, where you, you install the system and it adapts to your needs. So that's happening. You have real-time solutions that we don't use today because we sacrifice throughput in order to get uh, uh, real-time or deterministic behavior. Because uh, as they say, real-time doesn't mean real fast. Real-time just means predictable behavior. If something takes one second and it always takes one second, that's considered real-time. But we also want it to be fast. So we want not just the predictability, but we want it to be microseconds. Uh, we've been thinking about just brainstorming with some kernel developers about doing more in-kernel reliable multicast functionality uh, so to avoid the need for third-party commercial middleware solutions like TIPCO or Rendezvous or, or 29West. Um, and so that's an ongoing area of research. I, I don't know if it will happen anytime soon. Virtualization is important to us. It's not important in the cloudy kind of hyped up sense where uh, a lot of our Windows users, for example, assume you can only run one application per server. On the Linux environment, it's always been a multi-user operating system. I can run two instances of Apache to today and I can run ten instances of Apache tomorrow. I don't need any speci special operating system virtualization. However, there are some use cases for it that are important to us. And we're looking at, we're using KVM today, having migrated from Xen. Uh, we're looking at things like Linux containers as a lower uh, cost, or actually lighter weight solution. <laughs> Uh, to scale, or any, basically we're buying hardware to run applications, not operating systems. So if you're running a, a full operating system virtualization solution like KVM, you have your applications plus X instances of the operating system running. Uh, we'd rather get rid of that overhead and just dedicate the CPUs to the applications themselves. And I, I thought I'd add something since I'm speaking uh, on a campus. Uh, I, I thought I'd add something about what we want to see from people we hire. Because I find that most colleges don't prepare uh, people for a sysadmin role. You're either going to hardware or you're going to development. The skills required to be a sysadmin, where you have a well-rounded knowledge of all, all aspects of how machines work, how they interact on scale, and the difference between a purely academic solution versus a practical solution. Those are things that are hard to find. And I, I, I do see some colleges trying to implement these solutions. And I'd like you guys to think about that because I'd like to see more graduates coming out of college that are ready to be sysadmins. So I've talked a bit about our, our mission critical environment. I've talked about how cost effective Linux has been. And I've given you some insight into our implementation details. So I don't know if you guys have questions or what the format is for asking questions. So the question was uh, about replacing the BIOS. So I wanted to replace the BIOS with Linux. So imagine before you run your operating system, you boot off disk, you have a, a, an operating environment with an IP stack with tools you can use. I'll give you an example. We have, when we deploy, let's say we have a project that needs 100 servers, and on one weekend we roll 100 machines out into, into a data center. Before we load the OS, each machine has between four to eight NICs 
And typically of those, you're using three or four NICs. So that means someone has cabled up four connections to every server. We have tools that we run at the operating system that can look at packets. Uh, there's a specific thing called CDP, Cisco Discovery, I think it's called Cisco Discovery Protocol that our Cisco switches um, propagate using multicast that tells you, even if you don't have the correctly configured IP address, you can look at the Ethernet level multicast and you can say, My, this port on this machine is connected to this port on this switch. We have to have an operating system running for us to be able to verify that. If I could do that before I load the operating system from the BIOS itself, I could port our existing scripts to that. The vendor solution is to move to UEFI, which is, a, again, yet another operating system. You can do things like, in Core Boot, which is the currently developed solution that allows you to run Linux instead of the BIOS. Core Boot is actually a dual, it's actually two components. There's a thin layer that runs first and initializes the devices and then it loads into Linux. So actually it doesn't have to be core boot. As long as we can get to Linux very early on in the boot stage, you can do things like all your bias post messages, you could log them to syslog when the OS comes up. Or you could say when my machine crashes, crashes do not reinitialize memory. When it boots up, preserve memory and dump it on the network. There's a lot of things you can do. Uh, there's also fast boot times that are possible. You can say every machine that comes up. I've seen some implementations where they can boot a 4,000 node cluster in a few seconds because each machine basically discovers its peers and they start to almost, um, they can load data from the peers instead of going to central server. So once you have that richer environment, it opens up a lot of possibilities, just as having an open operating system uh, opened up the ecosystem for x86 in the server space. Does that answer your question? Um, what's funny was that I was in New York with Brian Stevens, the CTO of Red Hat, uh, the day that announcement came out. And uh, I, I don't think it affects us directly. Uh, what it was, if I understand correctly, first of all, did everyone hear the question? Uh, he was asking about how Red Hat's changed the way in which they release source code and whether or not that affects us. It doesn't affect us right now. The, what, what they did, if I understand it correctly, was they take an upstream kernel, they apply patches to that upstream kernel, and then they deliver an enterprise solution. And they would make the, both the vanilla source code plus the individual patches available so that you could download them and you could apply the individual patches yourself. Now what they've done is they've taken all those patches and applied them to the kernel and they're delivering the source code with those patches applied, which makes it harder for customers to dissect what went into that kernel. So it may create some friction down the line in scenarios where there's an obscure issue and we don't know exactly what's causing it and we want to look at the source code. It might cause some friction for us, but overall it doesn't directly impact us. Um, I, I don't know all the reasons behind why they did that. I, you know, I, I, we'll probably catch up with them in the next month or so to go into that, but today it doesn't affect us directly. I know that from what I've read online, there were some concerns about uh, cutting out some of the so-called competitors like CentOS. And I think that's where most of the animosity came from. So, uh, so my understanding is uh, most of the moving on from IBM, most of IBM to Linux So what is, what is the main advantage of the side of the problem? What is the real main advantage of the side So the question is uh, about our migration to Linux and the, the main advantages we see aside from cost. So, we were actually mostly on Sun Solaris before. We also have some uh, HP nonstop or tandem systems. Those are the types of proprietary systems we've migrated off of. Uh, the benefits, uh, I mean, I've covered a lot of those, but basically, aside from price, it's been performance, and it's uh, also the, our ability to diagnose problems quickly. So our reaction time, uh, reduced risk to our business, access to new technology, this constant uh, development of when a vendor provides silicon for a new platform, typically in-house, they're developing on Linux first. Uh, and I've talked to, I've been, actually in Japan last year, I was talking to some hardware OEMs. And what they told me was, um, they need a, something that they don't need to pay anyone for to be able to test the new platform. So if, I, if they come up with a new chipset and they just want to have some operating system running on it to check that it works, typically, especially for better devices, it's nice to run Linux on it. So. We're not in that space, but we benefit in the high performance space. 
you know, InfiniBand, 10 gigabit beat the Ethernet, kernel bypass technologies, all those things are being developed on Linux. So as a business, we have access, being on this platform gives us access to the latest technology. No, we, we use a combination of commercial tools and, and in-house developed tools. So I, I'll repeat the question. She was asking about the, our monitoring solution and how we detect failures on machines because we don't, you know, we don't rely on an external system to go into every machine and poke it. Um, so when I said that, I, I lied a bit because we actually do have a hybrid system that does a bit of both so that we're covered either way. And the hybrid system we use involves an HP OVO solution on the back end for, uh, for the operations folks. And behind the scenes for the sysadmins, the more tech savvy folks, we have these agents that run that are measuring system state. So basically, they'll take a snapshot of the system state and they'll know that, okay, these interfaces are up with these IP addresses, the CPU is at this level, uh, I have this many errors on this device, and they only report deltas. So if there's a change, we'll get a summary saying, all these, you know, 200 machines these five changed, and these are where the deltas are. It's much easier for someone to get one message that says these five machines changed, and these are the errors, than it is to get individual events from each machine. So, do you have time? Yeah. I don't know, just one quick question. Okay. All right, this one, sorry, the guy in the back was the first person to raise his hand. Uh, I have a question about the purpose. From what I understand, that the mother has a specific bias So the question was about core boot and uh, the risk of using it because, and also what types of uh, hardware it would support. So the main challenge today, the reason we're not using it today and the reason I mentioned it being a longer term solution is because you need low level information from the CPU vendors to initialize those chipsets. So Intel is, uh, not, is not providing any support. And because they're the dominant vendor, it means a lot of those Intel, latest Intel platforms are not supported. AMD is a lot more supportive of that effort. And they, the support for hardware is based on the chipset, the CPU vendors releasing chipset information to those developers. From a, a risk perspective, if you don't have, if you're reverse engineering a solution and you don't have the appropriate documentation from the vendor, you could break your system. Uh, but again, we're pushing this as a long-term strategy. The benefits far outweigh those risks. If you think about it, when we first started using Linux, a lot of vendors told us the same thing. Don't use Linux. You're going to void your warranty. It's bad for your hardware. Open source is bad. You could, you could hurt yourself. Uh, so, you know, we can shoot ourselves with any technology. It's not the fact that it's um, open source that is risk. It's the fact that the vendors are not releasing, uh, are not being open about what's going on. That's what creates more risk. Sorry, I, 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 didn't think, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. So we can, we can follow up later offline. Thanks, guys.